Undead Unluck is a wondrous shonen manga about a young girl who wants to die because she brings bad luck to anyone who touches her, who then gets saved by the undead, and together they want to help achieve each other's goals, for one to be able to live as a normal girl, and for the other to finally be able to die after being immortal for so long. In the chapters this year, we have entered the ring, gone into space, entered the martial arts tournament, went to school, visited the hospital, made ramen, visited the hospital again, and then went into space again. Undead Unluck has been my favorite manga to read weekly this year, which is why I want to talk about my favorite chapters that have come out in 2023. And I managed to narrow it down to 10. Without further ado, let's look at number 10. Chapter 154 is divided into two parts. The first part focuses on setting up the danger of space and telling us and the characters about Phil's situation stuck in a spacecraft. It establishes Uma activity where Phil's located and that only three union members will be able to go there. The second part of the chapter is about Billy, Fuko and Nico deciding who to send into space for this mission. It is fun to see which characters they each pick and why, like Billy wanting to send Fuko into space because she is the only one who is most experienced with negators and Umas already, or that Nico wants to send Ichigo into space as the scientist because she got astral projection, which Nico doesn't. It is very nice that in this team full of power users, Billy and Fuko are certain that Nico would still be the perfect choice, because he got something too, his desire to save that kid Phil from space, as we see in the first half of the chapter. In a world of power users, it is still a willpower that is most important. True shonen messaging. This whole decision process also adds weight to the rest of the mission, making us think about what if we pick the wrong people? It is not often that we have chapters of downtime in Undead Unluck, but when they are as interesting as this, whereas the readers are invited to think alongside the characters about who to bring on this mission, then these downtime chapters are more than welcome. Number 9. Chapter 187 has one of the craziest things I've seen in a battle manga. Namely, we go to the sun to meet our immortal friend there, only in Undead Unluck. Simply seeing Fuko and Andy's main body finally reunite, as well as how Andy is scared of a master rule and at the same time led us to the last remaining negators we need. He forgot ruin and unhealthy though, we definitely need unhealthy. This chapter had some of the best art too. Andy's burnt body is extremely detailed. This really reflected how much Andy has been willing to suffer to protect Fuko and the rest from God and the master rules, which is touching to see. Getting to know that the third master rules changed is also very exciting. Getting us speculating on what other master rules will be counterparts to the union members. I kind of feel like any of these three can be justice, but I'm not sure about the others. The only reason I didn't put this chapter high on the list is because it felt a little too sudden to go from a scene in the hospital after having some ramen in the previous chapter to standing on top of the sun. Last time we went into space we got two full chapters dedicated to setting it up, so at least a few pages of making preparations would have been nice. The chapter itself had great content though, like engine turned off the entire sun y'all, that's just insanity. Number 8. It was such a good idea to start the new loop off with Fuko saving the characters she and Andy had to eliminate themselves in the previous loop to join the union. With Fuko first saving Gina, who she played a big part in killing initially, and now saving Void Folks as a sort of tribute to Andy, repaying these two for the sacrifice they had to make in loop 100. And what is a better way to save someone than to beat them in a boxing match? Chapter 144 starts off with a flashback of Void down in the dumps, with no place to call his own. During the boxing match between Fuko and Void, Void realizes that his unavoidable ability will make it so he can never do the sport he loves ever again. Of course from the previous loop, we know that Void would end up killing a man in the ring and lose his drive to do boxing forever. This chapter culminates into revealing the second part of Void's flashback, where we are shown that the boxing world is a place he could call home. This information completes Void's character in the 100th loop, and even though it makes sense that his love for boxing is so big that God would want to mess with it, it is still nice to have it explicitly be shown, and not just implied, as we never got full insight on Void's tragedy and what got him his negation ability. Now we know why Loop 100 Void was so depressed and acted robotic. Something that also connects back to Andy and Fuko saving Void and Gina, is that both of them were upset with their job at the Union. Gina being upset that she had to kill without making any real change in the world, and Void pretty much feeling like a cog in a machine, not acting like a human, but as a robot following Union's orders. The parallels are real. Fuko swooping in right before Void was to lose his place in the world and offering him a new place where he can fulfill an even higher role to humanity is pretty much what Undead Unluck's 101st loop is all about. And this is a very satisfying way to save our boxer buddy Void. One door closes for Void, but before realizing it, a new door has already opened. Also as a big Hajime no Ippo fan, seeing Fuko do the Dempsey roll 
definitely got me excited. Fuku using both her fists and her hair as weapons is also really cool to see. Turning the burden of her long hair to her advantage in the new loop is just so good man. Generally, this chapter makes a lot of good use out of the negator abilities. Like Fuku giving a taste of what negator fights will be like to Void by using her unluck to summon a distracting light from the ceiling. Gina uses her unchanged to make sure that Fuku stays standing to honor Void and giving one less powerful opponent. That will even be a struggle to fight with the unavoidable ability. The amount of effort that Fuko put into this fight is clearly shown in the end, where even when Fuko passes out and loses the match, she remains standing until the very last second. Fuko is the realest character alive. Even though the centerpiece of this chapter is the climax to Fuko and Void's match, the other characters get their shine too, with Nico and Ichiko getting some fun reactions on the sidelines and Ichiko introducing Void to the round table. After this big fight, having the chapter end with a badass panel of a beat up Void in the third seed is just perfect. Fuko's efforts in the match were rewarded and Void got a new place to call home. So good. Also, uh, like and subscribe for me to make more Undead Unluck videos maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Number 7. It took us a cameo, being kidnapped, a death and 140 chapters where we finally got to know what Sean aka Unseen's deal was in chapter 149. We all know Sean is pretty much destined to play a side role, since his ability is too difficult to effectively use on its own. Like in the 100 loop, him trying to assassinate Fuko on his own went wrong, and the chapter tackles this aspect of the character beautifully. It is almost meta in how Tozuka created an ability that cannot work well on its own and created an insecure character around this ability. The chapter starts with a flashback, with Sean being disappointed about how his father does not get to play any main roles in the movies he acts for. So in Sean's interactions with Fuko, we see that his disappointment in having a father that only plays side roles and isn't recognized for it, turns into a want for validation for Sean. Oh, you don't need my power? Well, I'm leaving then. I mean, it would be useful for the plan. Oh, <laughs> that I'm in. However, when Sean realizes that his mission brings actual danger, he is immediately dead set on leaving the mission. But the only thing preventing Sean's escape is the one tiny union badge he's wearing. The flaw of Unseen is that objects that Sean doesn't consider his own don't turn invisible. So if Sean doesn't accept that he is part of the union, then it is not possible for him to escape anyway. Sean seeing everyone work together to save him and to protect each other made him remember his father's words. Being in a side role doesn't matter to Sean's father, because he knows he is part of the greater whole. If the main actor gets praised, Sean's dad feels just as good as if he were praised. The chapter ends with Sean finally understanding that teamwork makes the dream work. And Sean is not only able to make the union badge invisible now, but also anyone that he touches. This helps them defeat Creed. Such a great introduction chapter for both Sean and his ability. His invisibility is not as perfect as Meleodon in Hunter x Hunter at this point, but Sean being able to help his allies turn invisible at all must have always been the goal of the creation of this character. Ever since then, Sean has become pretty popular with fans, especially his sibling dynamic with Gina has been super fun to watch every time they appear together on the page. Sean went from a character who got about a page of screen time in the first loop to becoming the MVP of the new union. Can't name a better glow up than this. Oh, never mind, Fuko exists. Well, being a lovable loser is also part of Sean's charm, right? Number 6. Chapter 147 starts off with this color page, so you already know it's gonna be a banger. From the first page, we experience the chapter through Tela's point of view, setting the stage for what is to come. The whole concept of this arc is already very cool, because with Billy, Tela and Creed all in this arc, as well as the disc that Gina used being here, you can tell that in the 100th loop, the conflict that happens here is how Billy found it under with his three original members, and he likely found out about the Union when they came to this war to obtain disc, and probably ignored the under, under members at that point. This is not exactly how it went, but all these elements appearing does tantalize the mind for speculation. This chapter shows off the differences in Tela's and Billy's points of view. Tela thinks that obtaining this will only cause more conflict in the world, but Billy is more like the injured soldiers in the tent. Billy thinks that if Horizon Balance can carry the burden of holding onto this, Horizon Balance is the group they are in by the way, then maybe it will make for a world with less war. This self-sacrificial nature of Billy is what we saw in the 100th loop too, where he made everyone hate him so that he could save the world for them. Tela and Billy are okay with each other's views and both decide to uphold their own moral standard. 
Tella goes to meet with some injured soldiers and sings a song for them. Of course, the dramatic irony here is that Tella will not be able to sing a song for anyone ever again soon. Even though the soldiers got families at home, with the state that they are in, they found solace in potentially acting as a decoy to help their fellow men when the enemy attacks. It is right when the enemy shows up and Tella decides that he wants to follow his own moral code, protecting everyone including the injured, it is God who raises his ugly face when the enemy appears in Tella's radar. Tella then becomes unable to communicate this information to the camps due to him gaining untail. The story escalates how much the ability handicaps Tella, but first showing him unable to talk, then being unable to even press a button to send some information, and even the option to run back to camp, which probably would have been too late anyway, gets taken away from him, leaving Tella stuck in place, having to wait for the enemy to kill all of his comrades while he can do anything about it. This is the most powerful voiceless scream I've ever seen. Tella screams, but each panel of his despair shows Tella getting smaller and smaller, his voice remaining unheard. Creed shows up at Horizon's balance base and shoots the camp. We think all is lost now. Originally, this is where this war's great tragedy started, but then the heroes show up. This chapter is way too hype. A very powerful way to show that Fuko agrees with Tella's moral stance. She wants to save everyone. Saving everyone for the win! By waiting to make this reveal that Fuko and the gang were here only at the very last second makes it extra exciting. It being specifically Fuko, Gina and Foyt on the front lights, our first three seats is the cherry on top for this tragic chapter that turns to hope. Now we all love Tella, now we all love Billy, now we all love Fuko and Gina and Foyt, yes. Number 5. Chapter 182 answered many of the questions we've had for a while. And some we didn't even know we had. This, this chapter will be talked about for years to come. So yeah, Fuko meets the master rules. We get this awesome spread showing all of these new cool designs. We got Dr. Slump, the coolest guy you've ever seen in your entire life, and the Twink. This chapter is pretty much Fuko being a cold badass. Super memorable stuff here. Like Fuko saying she would be happy if she got to kill everyone here at once. That's a badass leader. The page showing Fuko's faith in Andy and trust in the union is incredible. As is the final page showing the master rules as the next thing on Fuko's to-do list. The first master rule being interested in Fuko is interesting setup for what is to come. And it's really nice that Fuko manages to find out what Andy has been up to. That is, chilling on the flipping sun for thousands of years solely to keep the master rules at bay, holy shit. Though we did see him traveling through the desert or something at some point, so uh, I hope that is addressed. The existence of this group of master rules gives some more insight on ruin and the worship of God. With him blurting out names of master rules all along without us even noticing all the time ago. It also answered this mystery that nobody had in mind. On how rules would be added every three months or so, even when the union didn't fill the quests. And this was revealed around volume 2 or 3. This sense of consistency that makes it seem like the Master Rules were part of this world from the very, very beginning, is just super satisfying to see in the story. However, I do wonder what the Master Rules were doing in the 100th loop, since we didn't get to see them at all. I mean, we do know that Nico beat language all on his own somehow, so that that's that's really cool. <laughs> but did Juice beat all of them beforehand? Did they not get sent on quest by God to attack the Union when Fuko and Andy joined? Hopefully we can find out. We did get a hint about this recently on how Unjustice counters some of the master rules. So um, yeah, can't wait to see more. I'm also really excited to see how Seal and Rune relate to the master rules, and of course how the master rules will act in the future. I wish to see all of these characters get at least a chapter to themselves, of fighting or whatever. I don't want to see a repeat of the Spring arc, where most of the new and mysterious characters of Under got skipped out on. Like at least the Under members get a second chance to show themselves off in the new loop. But if God is beaten now, before some mass rules get to do anything, then that is all that can be remembered by. Call me Aaron Jaeger, cause I don't want that. Number 4. Chapter 168 bookends the martial arts tournament arc, and it is such a sweet chapter. There are two things in particular I want to praise. First is Mui's confession scene. After a heartfelt battle, Shen ends up in a hospital bed. Mui visits, and when left alone, just the two of them, Mui closes Shen's eyes so that they can both make sure that Untruth isn't blurring her words, before confessing her love to him. Shen confessed his love during the battle, Mui after the battle. Finally, after all this time, Shen and Mui can see each other as equals, both in love and martial arts, without both having to be negators. 
as that difference between them is what bothered the couple in the 100th loop. This might be the most romantic thing I've ever seen in storytelling, I'm just saying. Her confession is so beautiful too. Movie telling Shen, I need you to stay healthy until we're both old and grey. Perfectly reflecting how Shen confessed his love by saying he wanted to keep fighting with Mui, even as they both grow old. So good, so beautiful bro. Also I want to take a second to appreciate Mui's ponytails moving in tandem with her emotions. Those guys are genius for coming up with that. The second thing I want to talk about is how Feng's character arc is concluded. With him accepting that he won't have to become unaging so his martial arts won't die out. Instead, his martial arts will live on and grow further with his disciples. It reminds me of what Chan's dad said in chapter 149. Feng indirectly thanking Fuko for what she has done for him is also heartwarming. Even though this is a perfect ending for the antagonist Feng, the writer and Fuko know that he is still necessary for the rest of the story. So this scene turns into Fuko's attempt to convince Feng to join her team. Saying she will take Shen and Mui isn't enough, but promising a mission where he is absolutely necessary gets him curious. Curious. Both of these scenes happen in the first half of the chapter, and it's already pretty much a perfect chapter. Let alone considering the hype that is the second half of the chapter. Revealing we are halfway through our Negator Collectathon and setting up for the next mission. Wanna say that even though all of the characters on this page returning will be super hype, especially Bex, I am most excited right now to see how Rune will be saved. I love him so much. He's just a misunderstood little vamp man. I love the way that the chapter sets up this hype mission that someone as powerful as Fang is a necessity for it to be successful, only to reveal on the final page that the mission is just to infiltrate the school, basically starting up an undead unlike high school alternate universe. And Fang's expression doesn't miss. It is also pretty funny how in this arc itself Fang is faced with another disciple of his getting Fang to show his weakness, namely when he stops fighting color when he changes into one of his students. And then he just never shows up again in missions. <laughs> Maybe he's off collecting artifacts for Fuko. He will definitely return sometime. If Andy was here in this high school setting, he'd definitely play the part of the delinquent tough guy, who sweeps the goody two shoots Fuko off of her feet. Gotta say it's also nice to have an arc where Fuko can live through the school life she had to miss in all previous loops. All in all, closure of one arc and the beginning of the next. Both super great. Number 3. I always liked Feng as a character, and I like to think the community loved this role in the summer arc too. But the 101st loop made him into a very different, and in my opinion, even better character. Chapter 167 starts off with this hilarious twist on the trope of a brute being disciplined by his sensei, and learning about the beauty of martial arts. Feng learns some martial arts from his sensei, alright? But he uses it to beat his sensei's face in. This gives us a pretty clear idea of what Feng's childhood was like. And the final match begins. Teacher versus student, who will come out on top? What this chapter is about is Shen finally surpassing his master and Feng coming to terms with his inner turmoil of not aging and being left behind by his martial arts colleagues as they retire. Shen ends up proclaiming his acceptance of Feng as his master and beats him with his powerful extremity of life technique. This technique can normally only be performed by Feng's unfading body, but Shen is willing to throw everything on the line to win this tournament and save his sister. And using this technique is a nice way to show Shen being able to get on Fang's level even without on fate. The students surpass their master. Extremity of life also changes the color of Shen's skin as a nice nod to how he ended up in the previous loop. As Shen gets Fang knocked outside of the ring, it is not only his strength that makes Shen end up winning, but his love for Fang as well. Only a student of Fang would know about how he gets riled up when hit by a good attack. This knowledge and Shen's fondness for his master allows him to use untruth on Fang, winning the match. Very poetic how Fuko making this Fang take care of Shen created a powerful and healthy bond between the two, even if Fang is still kind of an ass. I do want to point out that Fang in Loop 100 is a very different character from Fang in Loop 101. Unlike other characters like Billy, Shan or Void, who got a similar life as in Loop 100 prior to meeting Fuko, Fang's life was drastically altered in Loop 101. Where the original Fang grew old and started a martial arts school, it is Fang in Loop 101 that was opposed to having disciples. And it is what his new backstory revolves around. This change could have to do with souls changing when they appear in the timeline. And that Fang's soul, after fighting Shen in Loop 100 and meeting the Union, changed Fang's intentions. Not entirely though, because he's still a battle junkie of an old man after all, but yeah. Subconsciously, Fang's soul got him in a situation where he got unfaith earlier to help Fuko's cause, but it ended up making him miss his disciples. Getting unfaith earlier in his life 
means he wouldn't need the age regression artifact to stay in peak condition. So it all kind of works out. Maybe we get further insight on this phenomenon down the line if the other characters get the life story changed to loop 101. But if you don't think too deeply about it, this just works. One of the great things about Fang is that all this time it really seemed like his negator ability had no drawback. But the flashback showed that God, and the other as well, was playing the long game with Fang. Fang in loop 100 was forced to be stuck in a weak old body, but eventually he got to regress his age, so that his negation would only benefit him. But loop 101 took a different approach to Unfade. Now, 109 chapters after properly meeting Fang, do we understand the underlying tragedy of this character. A man, unable to age, unable to find peace with himself, forever hungering for a strong opponent. What he never realized is that in both the previous and current loop, it is his pupils who will give him joy when death comes near. Fang's final lines in his flashback were very powerful. Don't run from me. Don't leave me behind. Don't leave me by myself. One genius thing about this chapter is that it switches between flashes from Fang's life and him battling with his greatest disciple at the same time. These things are so connected that it is the perfect way to present a chapter like this. Also it is pretty cool that this chapter is exactly 100 chapters after Fang's defeat in the previous loop. A Goda moment. GG Tozuka for turning Fang from a great villain into one of the best characters in all of Undead Unlock. Number 2. A long awaited chapter, chapter 181. We finally get the reunion of our boy Andy with our girl Fuko. Woo, this chapter bro. Andy calling all the friends who don't remember him by name and utilizing their abilities to subdue sick. It's so sick. And it's a good showcase of what the series is all about. You can't do everything on your own. Without his friends, Andy couldn't defeat Sick within 15 seconds. Holy shit, he's so cool. The uni is so cool. And without Andy, maybe Fuka wouldn't have been able to save everyone during this fight. It's so beautiful to see Andy immediately recognize and cooperate with his friends. Also notice whose powers he uses. Chikara who he helped recruit originally, two of his exes, and the person who created the sword he uses. Some of the people most close to Andy. Very poetic. Also based on Ishin's recent lack of dialogue, I suspect he has been replaced by his granddaughter. Cause uh, yeah, he don't talk anymore. And the single high five from Fuko being able to summon a comet shows how crazy strong her love for Andy is. It's so good man. It's battle romance manga using the power of love to perform super strong attacks instead of the usual rage filled power ups we see in other battle manga. It's so sweet and cool and wholesome and incredible, let's go. And the craziest part of all this is that this arc was also about the Rip and Latla. Andy came back during this arc not only to stop sick, but also to keep his promise to Latla, to make sure she and Rip wouldn't have to cry anymore. What an awesome combination of both their pre and post loop character arcs. Uma move jumping in to save sick is also an interesting development. It kind of just makes sense. It is sort of implied that move works for the union solely because he wants to see interesting situations take place. And Move knows that Sick wouldn't be interesting in returning after being beaten up that badly anyway. Maybe Move is related to how Andy got on the sun too? I mean, by putting Andy on the sun, Move gets to see more interesting battles without the overpowered undead, and then he gets to protect his friend from the master rules. Would seem legit. Fuku's expression when she has to leave her partner behind, which she hasn't seen in thousands of years, speaks a thousand words. Then immediately following this up, with Fuko not being afraid to jump right into the lair of an antagonistic group we too only just learned about. It is so incredibly badass and exciting that together with everything else in this chapter, I had to put this one at number 2. I think it is a really good idea to set up this goal to defeat the Master Rules halfway to this Loop 101 saga. And the same goes for Andy's short reappearance here. The story has already used all of these new developments well by doing the Unburn arc next to get to the sun and incorporating the master rules into the new round of quests. Honestly, I'm surprised that Tozuka managed to make this arc's climax work so well. Making Andy's surprise return tie into the promise he made to Rip and Latla in the 100th loop, and also with the next chapter confirming that Sick being able to show up and Andy's mysterious disappearance are related. An awesome chapter that leads to another really cool chapter. But we already discussed one. Number one! Look. I did not want to put this chapter at number one initially, but then I started writing about it. And the thing is, Billy is just way too fucking good. Billy was already my favorite character in the 100 loop. I really love the way he turned from an ally to an antagonist, dictating the second half of the story, even though his intentions were always pure but misguided. 
you already got a great character there. Especially in how his final moments are dedicated to fucking up Ruin, as well as giving his blessing to Fuko and Andy. I love characters like this that are protagonists in their own way. Maybe I'll make another video on why Billy is so great someday. Well, in this chapter, we get to see Billy's side of the story in the 100 loop. Chapter 152. The setting is this. The game, a gunfight between the new leader of the Union and a man who would become the leader of Under. Billy establishes the rules. When a coin thrown by Foucault's team lands, Foucault and Billy get to shoot. Billy needs to hit Foucault in the right ear, while Foucault wins if she hits Billy anywhere on his body. Foucault asks if this handicap is alright, since Billy is blind and will have to determine when the coin lands by ear. But Billy is sure that this is fair. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Billy flexing his gunmanship from the get-go with his incredibly badass pose as well. I like how his face shows he's clearly not looking at Fuko at all. Just focused. You have to remember that Billy is so good with a gun that he managed to trick the entire Union that his ability was unbelievable. That's how insane Billy is. We get Fuko thinking back to Billy's past in the previous loop. Where it is revealed Billy gained his negation during a gunfight with Creed. Which was supposed to happen if Fuko hadn't shown up today. We get the reveal that Billy's family died because of some unfair reason. It could be war or sickness, or maybe it was leaked that Billy was part of Horizon Balance and enemies came to his house. Either way, Billy wasn't there for his family when they needed him and he feels guilty about this. Once again, a flashback completes the character, where we now realize that Billy's want to carry the burden of the Union in Loop 100 was not just because of his innate kindness, it also was because Billy saw his daughter in the Youngsters of the Union. Billy did not want to see these young people, who have already gone through so much, go through any more hardships. It was not only a sense of pride, but also a sense of shame of not being there for his family when they needed him. For his new family at the Union, he wants to make sure they do not experience hardships anymore either, ignoring what the Union members themselves want. Fuko says as much, Billy, your kindness is unfair. By choosing to carry every burden yourself, you make it so others do not have a choice in seeing how much their loved one is hurting. But Fuko is fine with saving Billy here, even if he doesn't unlock his negation, that is fine with her. Fuko is the coolest character of all time. As we flash back to the present, we see Fuko using a really dope strategy of putting her unlock in the disc itself and sending it to Nico. This causes the disc to tilt and fall down, and it will explode once it hits the ground. Billy is shocked that all Fuko's allies are sticking to her plan, even in this dangerous situation. Nico and Voigt stay standing on this falling ship, even if it endangers their life. How can you just trust your allies to this degree? At that moment, Billy remembers his wife, who is still alive in Loop 101. She was always okay with having married Billy, and her one request for him was to have faith in her, since he is always too eager to help others. It is okay to rely on each other. Billy remembering his wife and seeing Fuko put faith in her allies made his unfair negation blossom right before the coin lands. And now, because he subconsciously copied on draw, he's unable to draw his gun, and he loses the gunfight. In the 100 loop, we too saw Billy say he wishes he could switch places with Fuko. And now, meeting Fuko before it was too late, let him develop the ability that he truly needed. Unfair. It can now copy the abilities of allies who he acknowledges are strong. It is such a good way to show that Billy starting to accept that it's okay to rely on others will make him that much stronger. Since he now has made his strong ability even more overpowered than we could have ever foreseen. Also wanted to mention, yeah I like to mention things. I really love how Andra has been used in this loop as both an advantage and as a disadvantage for the characters. Especially since we didn't get to see it much in loop 100. Fuko shoots Billy, and now Tella and Billy have to join the Union. Fuko wins because she got to save Billy and got him to unlock his overpowered negation. And Billy wins because he is now able to protect everyone he loves alongside his allies. And also Fuko won the game that the chapter revolved around, lel. Having won the game, Fuko tells Billy what he needed to hear all along in the 100 loop. We don't seek strength on our own, we support each other. We're keeping things fair by believing in the possibilities. That is what Under the Unluck is all about, baby! That is what Under the Unluck is all about, yo! And that is why Billy and Fuko are the GOATs. The GOATs! And so is this chapter, yes! Also very nice that Billy's family got invited to save the Union as well. That's cool. 
This arc was just way too good. And it was just one out of eight amazing arcs that we got this year. 2024 is an exciting year for Undead Unluck. We're going to get back Juice, our home girl Tatiana, the cute Sadako, and the main homie Bex. I love Bex. The year of the Undead Unluck girlies. Can't wait to see it. Hopefully it will be just as great as the chapters we got this year. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Like I said, I might have a video cooking up. And there are lots of Hunter Hunter videos to watch on my channel as well. Will Andy return to us this year? Are we gonna fight the upper master rules? Will this be the final year that we get Undead Unluck running during the entire year? Let's find out and until next time. Bye bye.